are certain words I just won't use because I don't believe they're helpful, either from a scientific point of view or from a theological point of view. Nobody in the ancient world, until maybe the Neoplatonism of the 4th and 5th century, had any kind of category of the supernatural in their heads. They believed, and Greeks and Romans believed this, and I think most early Christians and Jews believed it, that everything that exists, exists as part of nature, phusis. So, they just didn't have the category of the supernatural. There was no word for it. I found a word around 500 in pseudo Dionysius's theology. He used the Greek word kuperphusis, which is the closest thing, but it's a new word in the, around the year 500. Before that time, I can find nobody in the ancient world who divides that universe into the natural world and the supernatural world. I believe that division came about mainly from René Descartes and his philosophy. So I, it might have been earlier, but that's where I place the beginning of modernity, which separates out a realm of the supernatural, angels, demons, souls, spirits, these kinds of things, separate from a range of nature. And so I just don't use the term because it didn't exist in the ancient world. Paul or Jesus knew nothing about it. No early Christian writer until maybe the 5th century or 6th century knew anything about it. Also, I don't think it makes any sense in the modern world, or what in my world is the postmodern world. That clean separation of nature that we know everything about and operates by rules that we know everything about, I don't think that exists. And I think some modern science shows that it doesn't exist. So I'm not going to use the word supernatural. What I believe, I also want to make a difference that what I mean when I say history. History is not the same thing for me as the past, nor is it the same thing as what happened. Since I don't know what it means to ask whether or not Jesus physically rose from the dead, I'm going to address the issue by saying, what about the earliest Christian claims about Jesus' resurrection can a historian defend as historical? What claims or stories rise to the level of history and how and why. History refers to what modern professional historians construct about what they think may have happened in the past. There's no way the past is successful. The past is gone. It doesn't, the past, it's shocking to say this, the past does not exist. So if I write a history about the Civil War, you can't take my book on the Civil War and hold it up next to the Civil War and see where I got it right. All you can do is take other people's historical constructions of the Civil War and say, does this, does Dale Martin play by the rules of modern historiography as well as or better than other modern historians? That's what historians actually do. They don't travel back in time to find the Civil War. They, they read historical accounts and judge which of them play by the rules of modern historiography. So the past is something that's happened, but the event of the past is not the same as the history of what happened. For example, no history of the Civil War could reenact the absolute whole Civil War, right? It's just it would be impossible. You'd have to take out the whole four years that the American Civil War happened. So the history of the Civil War is a story, a narrative about an event, not the event, nor is it even a reconstruction of the event. A reconstruction would be like if we could take the Titanic out of the ocean, the remains of it, haul it all land, and put it physically back together. That would be a reconstruction of the Titanic. Historians can do nothing like that when they write history. They are constructing history as accounts that they, about things they think of from the past. So what can we do with that about the stories of Jesus raising, rising from the dead? I believe we have basically five people we can go to for data about this. Paul, who is the only eyewitness, the only eyewitness we possess, I believe, is Paul, to any uh, resurrected body of Jesus. And then the four Gospels that are in our, our camp, Matthew, Mark, and John. What did Paul see? He claimed to have seen the resurrected Jesus. He is also the earliest account we have, by far, as Mike showed very well. But Paul claims that he saw the same thing that all the other people saw. He gives a list. And as Mike again said, Paul's claims in 1 Corinthians 15 depend on his insistence that what he experienced was not different in kind from what the twelve and the other apostles experienced. Paul's claims also depend on his insistence that the future resurrected bodies of Christians will be of the same kind as Jesus' resurrected body. And Paul's resurrected body, I believe Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15, is not a flesh and blood body. It is a body in which the flesh and blood has been transformed into a purely pneumatic body. And this is the way I prefer to put it, rather than the strange translations you get in your English Bibles of 1 Corinthians 15. 
Pneuma, this Greek word that's often translated spirit, in the ancient world was considered a material stuff. It was invisible, perhaps, or it was what we see when we see light. We see fiery pneuma. It's, it's, not, it's not too different from the way ancient scientists talk about the ether, which is that very, very thin kind of gaseous stuff, stuff that's the lightest and highest stuff in the cosmos. Pneuma was, Galen, the, med, the medical writer, said, pneuma is that stuff that exists in your head. You breathe it in the air. Your brain refines out everyday air and refines out the pneuma in that air. And that's a material stuff that exists in your body, and it runs through your body to tell your body how to move. This is pneuma running through my brain, through my arm, telling my body to go up and down. When I touch something, that's pneuma, uh, a physical stuff racing back and forth through the, ne the nerves to get to my brain to tell me I touched something, or that it's too hot. Pneuma is the stuff that brings the whole cosmos together in stoic thought, for example. So the word we translate spiritual or spirit actually was in ancient science and medicine and philosophy and I think in everyday thought a physical material stuff just very 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 rarefied stuff like we might think of as oxygen like we think of as oxygen so what Paul is teaching in verse 15 is flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and I make a much more elaborate argument about this in a full chapter of my book the Corinthian body where I show how this is a perfectly rational thing for Paul to believe in the first century what Paul believed was that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So he says, what kind of body does, did Jesus have when he was resurrected and we will have? It's as different as a seed is from a flower. But it's, there's continuity, but there's also discontinuity. And I, believe, I said the discontinuity is the flesh and blood body, which had some pneuma in it, will be transformed at the end of time, just like Jesus' body at his death was transformed so that it no longer had flesh and blood. It was a purely, it was a body made of pure pneuma, a pneumatic body. So it was a flesh and blood. The relationship to Jesus' pre-resurrection body to his post-resurrection body is like the relationship of a seed to a plant. 